now, Lord, we hand over the teaching of your word to you. We ask, Lord God Almighty, that you speak your word to us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Our topic is amazing possibilities in God. Amazing possibilities in God. And there are amazing possibilities in our God. And so we take our text from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, verse, verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We had the introduction last week, and we ended it with an assignment that we should all study Matthew chapter 19 from verse 23 to 29, and we will have a discussion today. However, we made a number of points. But let me set the context of this study to help give every one of us focus. We have spent the month of September studying on the redeemed of the Lord. The redeemed of the Lord. And you perhaps would have understood from the, re the redemption model that I shared with you, the redemption model that I shared with you, that when we're talking about rede redemption, we basically stopped at the point where Jesus came down to this earth. And as the bond offering, the, 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 the offering and sacrifice that God has given to mankind, and he fulfilled that. And therefore, by that blood, that death, that body that was crucified, the burnt offering that God chose, God appointed, we have been redeemed. And we dealt and stopped at that point. We have not entered into Jesus' ascension to heaven and his current role for our lives. Amen. We are going to come to that. Now. So as the redeemed of the Lord, Jesus has left us here on earth. And, there are, and we have to occupy till he comes. We have to occupy till he comes. And this is why we're dealing with this topic. The amazing possibilities in God for us. Who are the redeemed of the Lord? Who must occupy till Jesus comes back? And so if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, you see these amazing possibilities in God that we're talking about is not really your thing. So you have to give your life to Jesus. To be part and parcel of this, you have to surrender and become the redeemed of the Lord, those who have been washed by the blood of Jesus, those who have come into this everlasting covenant that God has made with mankind, through the sacrifice of his son. Glory be to God. So at the right time, appropriate time, as God will help us, we will come back to that second part of that study. That is the resurrected Christ who has ascended to heaven, who is now seated at the right hand of God. And we will again understand his role and duty in our lives. And while we, here are representing him and carrying on glory be to God. As Christians, remember, we are Christ-like, like Christ. So to continue the study, we want to take, therefore, your summary of what you gathered from Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 through 29. Somebody's said, anything is possible if we dare to believe. I love that word, that phrase the person used, if we dare to believe. When God speaks, do we actually dare to believe? The possibilities are there. There are so many possibilities, amazing possibilities, like you said last week, but it depends on we dare to believe. In this level, so we have to grow our faith. As we keep on growing our faith, we will keep on having confidence in God's ability to do that he said he will do. Just as a little child has believed in his earthly father, 
So also when we grow our faith, we will discover that we keep on our belief in God. We keep on increasing, keep on increasing. Because faith actually determines how far we can go and what we can achieve. If we say- Thank you, thank you. Thank you, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here, like I said, so that others can give their views. Thank you, Bra Lucky, excellent okay. point. So three key points. One, that nothing is hard for our God. Two, depends on our faith. Three, we should grow our faith. God bless you. Next person. What I took from the scripture is, well, particularly verse 26, where it says, but Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So basically, like what um, Brother Lucky said, there's nothing that's impossible with God. So we have to work on our faith and trust God that with him, we can do all things. And another key point was um, when the disciples asked Jesus, basically, in astonishment, like, how then can anyone be saved if it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? And I think a key point that stands out to me there is that we are righteousness or our salvation is not by our own doing and it's not by our power. So it's, that also takes believing in God and the grace of God to walk, walk in righteousness, basically. So yeah, that's why I took from that scripture. Thank you very much. So you've added, uh, so Brian brought faith on in this journey of all possibilities or amazing possibilities. And now you've added grace, grace. God bless you. Thank you for that. Um, Brother Sonny, do you want to say something now? Yes, Pastor. Okay, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, my lesson actually comes from uh, John 11, because we are talking about uh, all things being possible before God. You see, at that particular time that Martha and the sister, when they met Jesus, I think at that point, they have lost their only brother. And that was a very difficult time for them. And no one would have thought that at that time, they would have their brother back. But when they met Jesus, though as individuals, they lost hope and they were hoping in the future. But Christ let them know that everything is possible at that very particular moment. So my belief is that if we believe in God, God is never the God of tomorrow alone. He's a God of now. And because God is a God of now, if we believe in him, knowing very well that nothing is too hard for him to do. Look at that man that was buried after four days. The Bible said that man was buried after four days. But Christ had the power to bring him back to life. That was a great work, which no man would have been able to do. So there are things that God can always do for us. If we believe in him, and trust in him without postponing. If we believe in God, that God is a God of now, we we'll always do things that were actually marvelous. So that is really my lesson, Pastor. Thank you. Believe that God is the God of now. Hallelujah. The amazing possibilities of God for your life, whatever the situation, even the way it appeared to Mary and Martha in the case of Lazarus, believe that God is the God of now, now. Thank you for that contribution. Um, now we'll listen to, I think I'll take this comfort last, brother Dara. Okay, um, for me, the message that I got came in verse 21 and 22, when Jesus talked about uh, asking him to go the extra mile. And then the young man, when he heard that, he said that he was sorrowful, he went away, for he had great possession. So, yes, God is a God of all, all possibilities, amazing possibilities. He can make all, any, any, all things possible. However, where our heart is, our heart position is key. Because if we do not see what God sees, if we do not uh, position our heart in the place, we do not rate highly 
his word, if we do not take it as important, as critical to our life, then we begin to put a limit to what God can do, the level of expression that we see. Because that man, he, he, he had done all things, but then his heart was still tied to the word, the possession that he had. And at that point, he lost it. So that's it for me, where our heart is. Um, the, the position of our heart can hinder and limit what God can do. Thank you very much for that wonderful contribution. In the positive side, you stress we should go the extra mile with God. And on the negative side, you say um, uh, the, our heart will limit if, uh, if we trust in ourselves, trust in what we have like that man, then we will limit God. Wonderful. Wonderful. And you stress the importance of to go according to God's will, God's word. Thank you for that wonderful contribution. We go to comfort then, Sister Comfort. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The scripture of Matthew chapter 19, uh, 16 to 28 looks simple looks as if when you just read it there is nothing but i thank you for the opportunity of looking deep into it and if you look at that verse 23 and 24 following on what the brother dara said the response of jesus truly i tell you it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So, and looking at that, you can, we are talking of God's amazing possibility. So what was the weight, what was the burden of this rich man who went to Jesus Christ. Did his faith, we have seen faith, we have seen um, obedience. Did he obey Christ Jesus? Did he truly want to follow Christ Jesus? So Christ with his descending eyes was able to see the weight that is on this man. So, uh, we see that for you, if you have faith in Christ, if your faith is deep enough, if indeed you were sincere, you will be able to obey the instruction given to you by Jesus. So to him, the instruction of Jesus was as hard as causing a needle or a camel to pass through the eyes of the needle. But if he had a spiritual eyes, he would have seen that that was very easy. Why? Because true uh, obedience is the outcome of true faith. And that is what is uh, explained by James chapter two, verse 20. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was that, uh, was not, our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. So I don't know. So the rich man did not have faith deep enough to obey Jesus Christ. He saw the explanation of Jesus Christ or what Jesus Christ told him to do as being too hard for him to bear, meaning he did not have any sincerity in his question because when his faith was tried, he, did, he could not withstand, he fell. He did not follow Christ's pattern of humility. If he had followed Christ's pattern of humility, he would have strictly obeyed Jesus' commandment. So uh, if we want to be able to see the possibility in every situation, we need to cheerfully, honestly submit to Jesus Christ's love, 
his dependency on God. So if Jesus depends on God, we yeah. should also depend on him, believing that whatever he said shall come to pass. So our faith should be strong enough to put us into action because faith without work is inactive. So Great. we should then accept our faults whenever we are, the fault is being pointed to us. We should not believe in our own self, think we are right, righteous, like the rich man said, I have been doing this from my youth. But when it is now said to this, he thought he, he, he was too difficult for him to do. So we should not allow our burden, whatever it is, be it ourselves, be it our treasure, to rob us of obedience and submission to Jesus Christ so that our load will not become too heavy for us to carry. Thank you. Thank you so much for all those contributions. Excellent contributions. Um, emphasizing submission to Jesus, uh, depending on him, uh, obedience, and also um, taking correction as a spirit, uh, taking correction, just put it that way, the way you put it. Okay, now you can look at this, this scripture in simply two main headlines. Number one headline was about eternal life, eternal life. That's what this man came to ask Jesus, if you remember. And then the second headline is the reward of those who serve God. Those are the two broad headlines. And every other thing you have said, they are correct. But remember these two headlines. So in God, it is possible to have eternal life. With God, all things are possible. Regards or regarding eternal life. God is able to save us and save us totally, completely. All glory be to God in the name of Jesus. Number two, with this God's salvation unto us, God is able to give us, like Peter asked in that verse uh, 27. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And Jesus again brought these two theme into context. So Jesus said to them, as surely I say to you, as surely I say to you, that in the regeneration, so there is regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But that was specific to them. 29, and everyone, now everyone who has left houses of brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Praise the name of the Lord. And so God wants to do what seems impossible with man because no man can give eternal life. And along with that, blessings. As we always sing, Abraham, blessings are mine. And But what was the blessing of Abraham? Have you gone to read it again? I want to challenge us all, go read it, because that's what we're talking about here. The amazing possibility in God. So for the remaining few minutes that we have, with all that you have said, taking that together, let's read Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And see again the possibilities in God. 
And here is actually about the Old Testament heroes and prophets. How much more in this dispensation? Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 35. Hebrews 11, 32 through 35. I will read quickly. And as I read, I want you to just pay attention to uh, this. Give me example, an example of a person described here and also reflect your own life or even somebody that you know today. It doesn't have to be a biblical character. As we read this, give me an example of somebody that you will say, oh, that person, that's it, that's it. Okay, I will read. Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. Glory be to God. All of you were talking about faith. You, so we are already getting there, the key to enjoying the amazing possibilities in God. But I'll make a point again around this, because this is again talking about the Old uh, Testament heroes. And again, I've explained Testament. So when we use Testament, don't be confused about it. Those who were under the Old Covenant and those who are even preceding the Old Covenant, that's what it's talking about here. Also of David and Samuel and the prophets, verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, walked righteousness, obtained promises. Whose promises? The promises of God. Amen. You will obtain every promise of God for your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Stop the mouth of lions. Quenched the violence of fire. Escaped the edge of the soul. Out of weakness were made strong. What is the next one? Became valiant in battle. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens, of the enemies. Verse 35, we may receive their death raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. I'll pause here. Please give me an example. Any person, Bible, the Bible Bible, apart from the ones that were mentioned already, you remember the names that were mentioned, uh, Gideon, Barak, Simeon, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. So anybody living that past whom you can reflect on and say, wow, this is reflecting this person. Okay, I'll take just two, basically two. You have heard this. The heroes of faith. But all this, remember, is talking about people who lived before Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's important to always remember that because people talk a lot about Hebrews chapter 11, but they fail to understand that Hebrews chapter 11 was even recounting people who lived before Jesus. And then but before that, the context that is relevant to us today had been set. So, but let's hear. Praise the name of the Lord. Go ahead. Who? Dead, alive, living, can you say? From what you heard here, reflects. You can say it reflects the life of this man. Anyway, you can mention even the ones that we have mentioned before. So. Let's not limit it. Feel free. Say, who through faith subdued kingdoms, walked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, 
I'm sure you can tell me that one. Stop the mouth of lions. Somebody give me a name. Give me a name there. Yes, please go ahead. Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, God bless you. God bless you. So that's what we're talking about. Quenched the violence of fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay. Escape the edge of the sword. David is one of them that escaped the edge of the sword of Saul. Hello, Saul through spear. How many times? And David with nothing. God delivered him. And then eventually David showed up against Goliath. Hello, are you there with me? Out of weakness, we made strong, became valiant in battle. Uh, Sister Confo was sharing with me um, Second Chronicle, I believe, chapter 32, the story of um, uh, Confo, remind me. Of course, Hezekiah. He Hezekiah, right, right, right. Um, so, those who were weak by the strength of God turned valiant in battle, turned the flight. Turn to fly the armies of the aliens. All these are possibilities. Let me summarize them into headlines. And so we can focus on them. I brought out seven headlines from those amazing possibilities in God. However, remember, all this were heroes in the Old Testament, and they operated mainly by faith, by faith. And that's why I said the context that we should remember the, who we are. <laughs> we are Christians, a unique creature of God by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit lives, dwells in us and with us. And there is so much available to us than all these men listed here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to God. In Christ Jesus, there is so much available to us. The possibilities of God available to us is far greater than all these listed here. But let's see here the seven headlines from this scripture. And you take time again and study them and bring them out. Just like I brought the entire, uh, oh God helped me to, to see that. The entire um, Matthew chapter 19 that we read, 16 to uh, 29, into two key headlines. Eternal life that we receive through Jesus Christ. And what the provision of God for us while we while he tarries to come back to take us to be with him forever okay number one thing that you see here and um, possibility is dominion possibility you see here it says subdued kingdoms by faith they did what they subdued kingdoms Oh, so what is kingdom? The territory where you have influence. Can you define that kingdom? Can you define that kingdom and subdue it? It's available to you. It's a possibility in God. Number two, righteousness. Being right with God. You can see that there mentioned. It says, verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms walked righteousness. Righteousness. Number three, promises, promises. What are your desires according to the word of God? What has God promised you? Some of us have beautiful dreams and visions. Some of us have heard the word from God that those are the promises of God. You have read the scripture and the spirit of God inspired his word in your heart and you believed God for a moment. But where is that promise? So promises, number three. Number four, escaping danger, escaping danger. There shall no evil before thee. Even in this year, 2021, 
in the midst of COVID-19, you shall escape danger. It is possible in your God that though a thousand and come round about you, in this you will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, escaping danger. Number five, strength. As we heard last week, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Number six, victory in battle. Victory in battle. Whether it is spiritual, whether it is physical, tell yourself, I am victorious. Number seven, put enemies to flight. Put enemies to flight. That is victory over enemies. Number six was victory in battle. So whatever battle there is that you're seeing in your life, make up your mind that your victory is yours and you will obtain victory. And number seven is now to put the enemies to flight. They don't even come near you. You drive them away. Victory over your enemies. You put them to flight. All these are possible to you. What do you want? Brothers and sisters, again, it is your choice. As I said, these were heroes of the Old Testament, and they applied faith, all by faith. Now, this is who you are. This is who we are. Faith that we apply, we have received grace. We have received grace. And by faith, we operationalize the grace that is upon our lives. Hear me again. We have received grace. God's grace has been given to us. And by faith, in our dispensation, we operationalize that grace. So grace is general and available to all. But what you get out of life and out of that grace depends on your faith and your work of faith, how you operationalize that grace. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, please read it with me, read it with me, Paul made something clear to us there. He said in verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Here verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, you are what you are. What are you? By the grace of God. What can you say you have become by the grace of God? I say it again. Grace of God is available to all human beings. The grace of salvation is available. The grace to subdue kingdoms, as we mentioned, is available. The grace for righteousness is available. The grace to obtain the promises of God is available. The grace to escape any danger whatsoever is available. The grace for strength is available. The grace for victory in battle. The grace to turn all enemies to flight is available. But you operationalize that grace by faith. What have you become? Like Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace is general. The grace of God is general and available. There's no private grace of God. The grace of God is available. But what you get in life depends on what you do with that grace. And it is faith that operationalizes grace. Glory be to God. To conclude that, so Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
and his grace to me was not in vain, but I labored more. What did Paul do to bring grace to manifestation? He labored. He put the grace to use. I labored more than, I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet, not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Glory be to God. So some people want the grace to just go and talk for them. They want the grace to walk them into their miracles. They want grace to rise up and go to market and bring the food and put in their mouth. They want grace to bring their desires for money, for degrees, for promotions, for breakthroughs into their houses where they lie down on their bed. Brothers and sisters, I disappoint you. It doesn't work that way. The man who taught grace, understood grace, called Paul the apostle, gave us the key. He said he was the least of all the apostles. So if you were to rank the apostles by reason of status or whatever thing, you would, he was the least, he was the last. He wasn't even there when Jesus was physically with the disciples. But he said, so he was like a child born out of necessity. He said, but he did something. He knew how grace works. How grace works. And he labored by grace. Yet not himself, but the grace who worked in him. Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to God. So. How do you put this grace to work? So in your study, the study of the exercise, many of you brought out faith, you have seen. You brought out grace, belief, and the extra mile. So you see, you have actually cap captured what we we're really focusing on, which is the work that you need to do. Let me summarize today as we go into this deeper subject then. To put this grace to work, I have come up with five headlines, which I call the five W's. The five W's. So note this down. Number one W is will, the will, the will. And will is about your determination to live for God and glorify him in your life. Number two aspect of will is your determination to know the will of God, which is the word of God. Without the promises of God, we will be doing our own thing. And when you do your own thing outside the will of God, you are on your own. I am on my own. Number two is the determination for you to succeed in life. Like Paul said, he says he, this is what he does. He forgets about the things that have passed. And he press forward to the mark. He press forward towards the mark of the high, link, the high calling of God for his life. So that's it about will. Point number two, the number two W is wisdom, wisdom. So again, will and wisdom from the point of the word of God are interwoven, wisdom, the wisdom of God. The Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally to all men and the uh, not. Number three, number three is waiting. Waiting. So this is where the place of prayer and the name of Jesus comes in. And I will talk about that a lot. And then number four is work. And number five is worship. So will, wisdom, waiting on God, 
work, the service that of God, serving others for God's sake. We, this is where evangelism also comes in. Worship, your personal communion and fellowship with God. Let me take a few minutes. Maybe you have a question or something really resonated with you that you want to mention. Feel free to mention it now before we round off. Okay, um, let's open the floor now. Yes, Brother Lucky, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Pastor. I, I can see the relationship you drew between faith and grace. And you said that by faith, we operationalize grace, that mm -hmm. what we get in life depends on that grace. Mm -hmm. Yes, back, I had this very successful friend. I am not going to criticize his lifestyle, actually, but he doesn't talk about faith in God but it places so much emphasis on grace. It doesn't talk about faith. It doesn't talk about belief, but he attributed his success in life to grace. So I want you to, in this context, without talking about faith, but emphasizing on grace, I want you to draw a relationship between this in view of his lifestyle and the success which he attributed to grace. I'm not to fit. Thank, thank you, bro. I've brought something very uh, succinct to help clarify this. Um, let me again tell you that that brother almost fooled you, brother. <laughs> he almost fooled you. Beloved brother, it is not talk. Hello, the kingdom of God is not in talking. The brother was actually demonstrating faith, not by talk. He knew the grace that was upon his life, and he lived by that grace. That's it. So it is not in the talking, it's not in, it, it, even if he tells you, I don't believe in faith, I don't believe in belief, I don't, even if he was saying so, yet he said, I believe in grace. The truth is, that is faith. So faith is not talking. Faith is, that, is action. Faith is living what you believe. So you have nailed it for all of us. You see what the Bible said then in the book of James? It, it was challenging. He said, Let's talk the person who is talking with his mouth about faith, faith, faith. Bring the result of his faith and let us see. But another person who is not talking, but has by the works of faith achieved something, shows you. So let's look at it, uh, James chapter 2, right? From verse 17, let's start from verse 17 quickly to remind ourselves. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith, the real faith is shown by the works. Hello. So that brother knew what grace meant and exercised faith. And the result you saw, even with the so called lifestyle, yet grace operationalized by faith brought result. So we live in the dispensation of grace. That's why I was saying we have to, when we read that Hebrews chapter 11, we must understand that it is indeed good. It's a good background. But well, those were all people before Jesus came. Jesus came and brought grace. However, grace is operationalized by faith. And I also said that what we receive in life, grace is available to us all. Well, 
However, what we get in life, the result we get in life depends on what we do with that grace. And so Paul there taught us that he labored with the grace that was upon him and not him, but the grace itself then manifested and people could see the grace of God upon his life. But I'm lucky, I, I don't know if this points and brings a bit of clarity. Otherwise, please, let's talk on this. This is, it. This is what this is about. Let's hear if you, this helps to clarify. So grace and faith go hand in hand. You've seen the relationship. And faith is action. And yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay. I got a follow-up question. Okay. My question is this. It's a follow-up to your explanation, which is clear. So I want to ask, can an unbeliever consistently depend on grace for success in life? Thank you, Brother Loki. Again, which, what makes the person unbeliever when you said he depends on grace? Does that not mean that that person believes? So grace, which grace? Isn't it the grace of God? If it is the grace of God we are talking about, that means the person believes. And that's this is the life that many people live at times. But let me come to three things. I thought I was going to bring this at the end. Now you've pushed it. And we're going to come to that. The grace that we're talking about must uh, fulfill three dimensions of God. Three dimensions of grace. So pay attention to this. And this is where many people also make the mistake. Your God and his grace, whether it is the God Almighty that we are talking about or another thing that other people practice, must be able to do three things. And you will see where every other so-called God or practices fail in number three. Number one, I think this will pay it to this. Like I said, I thought it would come at the end, but you have pushed and we have to have it now. Number one, the grace must be able to achieve something, you know? So what can your grace, the grace that is upon your life, grace of God, grace of whatever, what can it achieve? And that's why I say that there are lives that people would live and it does not glorify God because one cannot look at it and say, ah, there is grace here, you know? What can this God achieve? What can this your God do? That is number one, achievement. Number two, character, character, character. So how does this grace behave? How does this grace behave? Does this grace behave holy? Is this grace righteous? Does this grace foster peace? You see? So that's why some people will use some forces and powers, but at the end, violence sits with them. Why? Because the author of violence is their source. But they can achieve great results. They can achieve something. So we must know this so we are not deceived. But whatever any power, any source can achieve, God can achieve much more. That's why we as children of God must know the amazing possibilities in our God. So possibility number one, achievement. Possibility number two, character, righteousness, holiness must be there in our God. Possibility, I mean, then number three is transcendental 
life. That's the life that will transcend this world. So what is the hope that this grace gives? So the grace that we're talking about gives eternal life. And that is, that is the only grace that gives eternal life. So therefore, or therefore, one may believe in God. God is a merciful God. He makes his rain to shine, I mean to fall, and makes his sun to shine upon both the righteous and the unrighteous. That's in the Bible. That's why you keep hearing me talk about grace of God is general and available. And what you get out of this grace depends on what you do with the grace. So there are people who have tapped into the grace of God to achieve great results, achieve great excellence in academic, in money, and all that, all in this world. And they have not tapped into that same grace to live the character that God expects of them. And they will face the judgment of God in that. Then some even try to do money, do uh, that, that, and manage character. You look at them, you would say, wow, this person is so polished and all that. But they still have their limitation anyway. And then they refuse the ultimate grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of his blood for eternal life. God will judge everyone according to his grace that he has provided. So these are the three dimensions that you must know. So I believe the answer falls out straight to you that indeed that person is not like he doesn't believe in God. He believes. That's why he is able to talk about grace. But he is functioning in a section of grace, not taking the totality of the grace of God. And that's why I'm teaching this. So those of us who have come to Jesus Christ must know. In fact, the sad thing is that those who have come to Jesus Christ focus on, and you know there are people, those who have come to Jesus Christ, you can focus on the eternal life side alone and you become, and you are very poor. It's also because you refuse to apply the grace in achievement space. And that's what we want to teach on these four or uh, five W's. That having come to Christ, we must know, like Paul said, I labored more than them all, but it was not I, but the grace of God that was upon my life. Thank you, Brother Lucky. Oh, please, let me hear. Uh, does this address it for you? And Yes, Father. Yes, you, like God has said, you nailed it. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, my brother. You pushed me. You brought my concluding message to the fore, but it's good because this is what this is. Yes, brother Sonny, please go ahead. Hello, Pastor. Yes. Uh, uh, please, I really want to ask uh, a question. Okay. Uh, the the rich man that we see in the in Matthew nineteen. Yes. That we are talking about he came to jesus and asked him what he should do to have eternal life and just told him yeah. what he should do i think what christ was telling him was the was trying to take him back to the mosaic laws which the man replied that he had actually done all of those things even as a child that he had been doing that now my question is this this person had been keeping the mosaic laws why did he come again to be looking for what he should do to have eternal life Excellent question, Brother Sonny. But let's again make your question complete. First of all, Jesus didn't tell him to do what, go and do what is in the Mosaic law to get eternal life. Remember, Jesus took him further than that because Jesus knew. So Jesus knows everything. Jesus knew what he was lacking. And so Jesus was trying to lead him from where he was to where he should be. So first, remember that. That's to put the question straight, because you asked and said, Jesus told him to do this, and he did. He was already doing that. Why did he? So that then brings us to your question. 
So the man knew by himself if he was sincere. That's we have two aspects of this man. Number one, we take him as somebody who sincerely was seeking for the truth. So we, if we take him for somebody who sincerely was seeking for the truth, then he knew that what he was, he was inadequate, just like any sinner knows he is a sinner. Anybody who does not have the witness of Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16, verses 15 and 16, quickly, we need to touch on that for those who may be listening, knows that he is not right with God. It doesn't matter how religious you are. Let's read it again. Verse 15 says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom you we cry out, Abba, Father. 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Anybody who doesn't have this witness knows that he is not right with God. So the man knew that though he was practicing this commandment and keeping everything, he was inadequate. Just like many people who are religious, for them, the work of God is going to church every day. In fact, I mean everything. Like I, I used to tell people when I was uh, running a party, I said, <laughs> don't think that you coming to church, you are doing service to God. You, you are doing God no service. I, I hope that thing gets clear to human beings. You're doing God nothing by coming to church. Let's get this clear and let's help humanity understand this. You're coming to church for your own self. It's for your own good that you're coming there. What God wants you to do as a service to him is number one, your own life that you give to him, your time and fellowship for him, and then what you agree with God to do to humanity for God's sake. So there are people who come to that church and they are doing service to God. Why? Because they have a determined goal that they are doing something to please God. So unless you come to that point of a determined goal, and we don't see God with our eyes, I've said this and said this, so how do we serve God really? Our service to humanity, including telling them that Jesus saves, Jesus has died for all humanity. So what we do for humanity, for God's sake, that's to please God, in order to honor God. What we do, even by our own self, that constitutes a service to God. There are many of them. I'm just, again, giving the general context so we can understand. Okay, so back to this man. So he was inadequate. And Jesus knew he was inadequate, of course. So let's, if we take the position that he was sincere, which I think we should take that and not um, 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 adduce any other position because it isn't stated in the Bible. This is sufficient position. That he asked Jesus sincerely, How, what do I do to get eternal life? Uh, even though many people ask Jesus questions to tempt Jesus, right? But this one, at least Matthew didn't say so, that he did it to tempt Jesus. He asked. And now Jesus told him he should come and follow him, Jesus. You see, that was the point where he turned away. So you ask your question, why did he ask? Sincerely, if we take that position, he knows that Jesus, he himself felt inadequate. And of course, Jesus answered him to show him that the law that he was practicing was also inadequate. But it is important. That's why Jesus started with that. So again, let's bring this to bear. It is important. Those commandments are important. That's why we talk about the grace must manifest in three those three aspects. Achievement, character. The character is about this. This is what is written here. 
you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But doing that alone is not enough. You must have Jesus. It is only in Jesus that you have the third dimension, which is eternal life. Glory be to God. Brother Sonny, did that address it for you? Yes, thank you, Pastor. Please feel free. You can add, you can ask questions, and anybody here can add as we are discussing. Let it not just be um, anything that comes as you hear this, because this is indeed the session. Any other question, any other comment? Okay, if there is no question and no comment, no, I think I want to get a comment. I believe as we're speaking in the space of Raloki, a question from Sonny, I believe something must have resonated with yourselves. So one more minute, please. What did you hear? What resonated with you? Sister Comfort, you know, I will ask you. <laughs> and Brother Dara, get ready. Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity. Like I said, um, it is a very um, stimulating discussion and also an eye opener to uh, many people. Yes, I did also uh, put some question, like you said, did this rich young man knew that good deeds alone cannot fetch him eternal life. Great, agreed. Then like, yeah, my brother, what really does he mean? So you have been able to say, uh, help us to see that the rich man must have been sincere. He must have been a Pharisee. I will, I will, that one I'm adding. So he must have known about eternal life. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he knows, um, perhaps he has seen Jesus. His deeds is certainly different from the way they were acting. Mm -hmm. So now he wants to know where mm -hmm. is this man, mm -hmm. uh, source of these good deeds coming from? Mm -hmm. So he must have been sincere. But like he, we have seen, um, this man did not believe that it is possible with God. Everything is possible that his treasure will not give him that everlasting life. He needed to do much more, to listen to Jesus Christ, to show like what you have said, some action demonstrate his faith beyond where he knows, where he stops, listening to Jesus Christ and act the way Jesus was acting, yeah. uh, the way Jesus wanted him to, to act. So uh, you have uh, helped us to know uh, all this is Jesus was helping us to see that God is able to give eternal life mm -hmm. only if we follow Jesus Christ. Yeah. There is no, nothing that can stop. So uh, like I, I have seen grace and faith will help us. Grace upon grace, like you have said, we ha the grace is there. God had already given us the grace of Jesus Christ coming. Yes. To what extent do we allow our faith to help us to benefit? from this grace that is available to us. We Thank must you. be ready to work hard. Thank work you. hard Thank for you. us to achieve something. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. So Adara, 30 seconds. For me, it's the dimension. The dimensions. I mean, I, I didn't uh, see all of that coming. The, the, the new dimensions, the possibilities from the conversation and even what um, Brassoni brought in, it, it, it just um, opened my eyes to, oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so this can happen, this can happen. I didn't really see any of that in the right. 
initially. So it's great. Thank you for that wonderful contribution. Our time is up, and this is where we'll draw the curtain for today, because I want to pray anybody hearing. In fact, I think we'll just do that prayer. Anybody hearing me, you want to give your life to Jesus, just pray with me right away. Say, Father, I have heard your word, the amazing possibilities in God through Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I come to you. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord, you are my Savior. You died for my sins. Heavenly Father, I therefore ask, please forgive me all my sins. Wash me with the precious blood of Jesus. And now I repent of my sins. I forsake them. I ask Almighty God, give me your Holy Spirit and transform my life by your Spirit. And Father God, sustain me by your power to live and walk in your righteousness and do your will. And Lord Jesus, when you come, Again, to take your people, let me be with you, go with you forever. Thank you, almighty God, in Jesus' name. Amen.